Let's uh, take our Bibles this evening and open them to Acts chapter 8 and verse 5. I uh, appreciate J Jim and Gabe filling in for the teaching um, last Wednesday and this Sunday. As you guys uh, probably know, I was diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer. Uh, let's see, I think we finally got that diagnosis formally about mid-February, February 16th. So, happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> Post-out Valentine's Day. So, basically, it was of the kind that uh, wasn't terribly large. It was um, a centimeter and a half, they told me, after going through... Um, an MRI, and then a biopsy. But it was not the kind that I could just ignore. They have like a scale that they use these days to, to figure out where your cancer is. They call it, I think, the Gleason scale. These are all words I knew nothing about, by the way, um, before all this happened. Now I'm almost a subject matter expert in the whole thing. But it was like the middle of the Gleason scale, so it was kind of like, well, you're going to have to do something about it soon, or it's going to get a lot bigger. So basically what they do is they give you these options, and it's kind of like pick your poison kind of thing. Uh, the first option is total removal of the prostate. The second option is like 30 straight days of radiation. And then they kind of give you these options and they say, well, here's the side effects for this one. And I'm like, thanks, but no thanks. All right, here's option two. Here's the side effects for that one. Thanks, but no thanks. When you hear, hear what the side effects are. So fortunately, there is um, another procedure called HIFU. Uh, it stands for, well, it's, the acronym is H-I-F-U. And it stands for High Intensity Focused Ultrasound. So the best, when, when they explain it to you, the, the analogy a lot of them like to use is the analogy of a um, uh, magnifying glass held up to the sun and it burns, you know, a leaf. But you can focus it in a way that it doesn't burn the whole leaf. It just burns a little part of it. So it's stuff that's way above my pay grade to understand. But it has something to do with the... Uh, and it's amazing what these guys are able to do. The, the crossing of the sound waves. And so they, they do this procedure. And they focus on just the problematic part of your body in my case, the prostate, where there was a cancerous tumor, and they just go in and they, they kill it. So given my choices, um, that's the option that we picked. We picked a HIFU option. Uh, the nice thing about HIFU is it's minimal in terms of um, you know being invasive compared to the other options. And uh, you're basically out for about four days, and then you're back. And so here I am. <laughs> um, so I had the HIFU, I had the HIFU surgery uh, Wednesday, uh, a week ago, today a week ago, in the morning, and it's an outpatient uh, procedure. So, you know, I was taken home. My wife, who's a, the great hero in all of this, if you knew anything about my wife and how selfless she is taking care of me and our family. Uh, my wife basically drove me home um, in the afternoon after the surgery was over. I think I was out of there about 1.30 or 2. Had the surgery about 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning, something like that. Um, of course, it's the kind of surgery where they put you under. So I was a little bit out of it more so than normal, but came home, um, did what they told me to do, um, just kind of hung around and was lazy for, you know, from Wednesday through Monday, 
And then Monday came around, and the, uh, the, the final part of it that has to be removed from me is a catheter. I don't know if I want to really go into all this as I'm speaking into a camera in front of a bunch of people. <laughs> um, so, you know, here we go. When you urinate, you use certain muscles, and they don't want you to use those muscles for a while, so... Here's a catheter, which is an interesting experience, um, having one of those. So I got that taken out finally Monday morning, and then Tuesday I felt fine enough to just go back to my normal schedule. That's what the doctor said would happen. Um, the surgeon, who is a pioneer in this area, uh, his name is Dr. Mobley. He actually has published a book on this. Um, he did the surgery. He uh, went up to my wife. I was, of course, out of it, but he went up to her and he said, you know, I don't think he's going to have to come back. And we're like, oh, praise the Lord, meaning they were successful, he thinks, in burning out, you know, the problematic area. So I have a um, follow-up doctor's visit with him, I think, in two and a half weeks something like that, but, you know, he was very, very positive about everything, and um, just really want to thank people out there for the cards and well wishes, notes, uh, people saying I'm praying for you, the texts. It's one of those things that you really don't appreciate, those kind of things, until you walk through something like this, which is my first rodeo, so to speak, going through something like this. So there have been so many cards and well wishes, some of them I haven't even had a chance to open yet, emails, so I thought I would just do a blanket thank you to everybody, <laughs> and I'll try to get to your card and email as, as time permits. This is um, very interesting because this is a procedure that was not even approved by the FDA until 2019. So in the old days, prior to 2019, people had to go to Mexico, the Caribbean or somewhere to get the procedure done. I guess they hung out in the resort, the Caribbean resort after the surgery, had a few margaritas and Things like that. Is this a, is this on? Am I being recorded? I guess I am. <laughs> a, few, a few margaritas, and then they recovered and they came back to the United States and everything was fine. So I'm fortunate that I'm living in a time period where a this kind of procedure is available, and b it has been you know approved by the FDA. So I feel fortunate in that sense, and I just feel blessed because you know we talk in Christianity a lot about the peace of God, God's faithfulness. You know, we can really talk those doctrines up. I talk them up from the Bible, but it's another thing when you actually experience those things. And I'm here to tell you with my problem, as you will experience in your Christian life with whatever problem is in front of you, if you just walk by faith, God will help you out. Uh, he, he provides for our needs. He provides calmness in the midst of a storm. And so I'm very, very grateful, you know, that he would be glorified, you know, through something like that. So I'm, they're not entirely sure what um, <clears throat> caused my prostate cancer. Uh, I kept asking, well, what causes it? You know, you know, my, my first reaction is that I do something through, you know, maybe inadequate diet or something that brought it on myself. And pretty much the answer that I'm getting is it's sort of the luck of the draw. It's uh, your family tree. And if you go back into my family genealogy, my uncle... Uh, has produced, it's amazing what he's done, uh, three very, very thick volumes on my family tree, my mother's side, the maternal side. 
And if you ever have trouble sleeping at night, I'll let you borrow some of those volumes. It's just unbelievable the amount of work that he would put into producing these. But apparently this issue of prostate cancer and those kind of things, it runs on my mom's side of the equation. So I got what the doctors called the luck of the draw. And so uh, Dr. Mobley is pretty confident that um, once HIFU takes place, there's a very limited chance, almost non-existent chance it will come back. Of course, it always could. Um, he said in all his career of doing HIFU, he's only had two people, two patients, you know, where it's returned. And one of those relates to cancer that got outside of the prostate that he was unaware of. So that accounts for one of the cases. So I guess all things considered, I'm in a pretty good position. Um, there's a lot of people that have this issue, prostate cancer, who have gone the more radical routes. And I have to say, to be honest with you, that I'm a lot better off <laughs> with what I decided to do, what we decided to do, rather than some of those other routes. So all things considered, I'm very, very grateful. So let's just give the Lord a round of applause. Can we do that? All right, let's close in prayer. No, you guys didn't come to hear that, but I felt I owed that to you because a lot of people have been saying what's going on, and that's kind of the long and short of it. You guys still want to study the Bible tonight? Let's go, <laughs> let's go to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8 and verse 5. First of all, to my wife out there, Anne, did I miss anything in my summary? Oh, good. <laughs> Acts chapter 8 and verse 5. Um, we are now in a <clears throat> section of the book of Acts where it relates to another deacon. This particular deacon's name is Philip. Uh, the first deacon that we learned a little bit about was Stephen, Acts chapter 7. And now we're learning about a second deacon named Philip. And so his ministry basically spans from Acts chapter 8 verse 5 through the end of the chapter. You can take this chapter and you can divide it into two geographically. There's Philip, the deacon's ministry in Samaria, verses 5 through 25. And then there's Philip, the deacon's ministry in Judea, uh, Acts chapter 8, verse, now that says verse 6, it's supposed to be verse 26 uh, through verse 40. There up north is where Samaria is, the circle up north. That's where Philip ventured out into. And then the circle down south is Judea. So you'll notice that Jerusalem, where the church was born, is right there in the middle, towards the middle between those two circles. And then those outer regions, as you move up north, is Samaria. And as you move sort of down south from Jerusalem, um, you have a reference to Judea. So the first part of Philip's ministry takes place in Samaria, and the second part of his ministry takes place in Judea. First part of his ministry, verses 1 through 25, actually verse 5 through 25. Second part of his ministry in Judea, verses 26 through 40. So we start tonight Philip's ministry in Samaria, Acts chapter 8, verses 5 through 25. That's where he went, up north into Samaria from Jerusalem. So here's basically what happened in Philip's ministry in Samaria. You have the evangelization of the Samaritans, verses 5 through 8. You have the conversion of Simon the sorcerer, verses 9 through 13, 
which is a major hot button issue. Almost every commentary that you read will tell you that Simon was not really saved. He was not a believer. His faith was spurious. Uh, the Calvinists say Simon wasn't saved because he didn't persevere in good works, so his faith was never real. The Arminians would say he lost his salvation. And this is really a good thing to ask people if you're trying to figure out where they are on the doctrine of grace. Um, ask them about the conversion of Simon the sorcerer. Because most people that don't understand the doctrine of grace will basically say Simon the sorcerer was never saved. I, I think there's very, very convincing evidence here. In fact, I think the evidence is irrefutable that he was saved. And the reason people, that don't, reason people don't think he was saved is they're reading the text through the lens of their own theological system. Rather than allowing the language of the text to correct their theological system. So almost every single commentary you read on this, you know, is gonna get, is gonna get it wrong. I'm gonna try to show you that he clearly was saved he just hadn't had a lot of time to grow. In fact, he had no time to grow. So he was still thinking in a worldly, carnal sense. But his conversion is described in verses 9 through 13. And then in verses 14 through 17, Peter and John have to come and lay hands on the Samaritans for them to receive the Holy Spirit, which is weird from our standpoint, uh, when someone is saved, they get the Holy Spirit immediately. Romans 8 verse 9, if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you don't belong to Christ. But here's a case where some people believed and were saved and they don't get the Holy Spirit right away. Uh, the, disciple, the apostles have to come from Jerusalem to lay hands on these Samaritan believers so that they can receive the Holy Spirit. And this is something that the Holy Spirit did intentionally in this unique case because of something called the Jewish-Samaritan racial conflict, which was a conflict <coughs> that goes all the way back 700 years before the time of Christ. I'll show you where that conflict came from. And if the Holy Spirit had come immediately upon the Samaritans without this delay, and the Samaritans didn't understand that they belonged to Jerusalem, and Jerusalem didn't understand that they belonged to Samaria, because we are now all one in the body of Christ, what would have happened is you, right out of the gate you would have had two churches. You would have had a Jerusalem church and a Samaritan church the 700 year conflict would have just been dragged right into the church age. And so this is a peculiar case where the Holy Spirit was delayed to prevent this rupture from occurring. So we'll get into that in verses 14 through 17. But after Simon the sorcerer is saved, he wants power, verses 18 through 25, because he saw Peter operate in power as he laid hands upon the Samaritans and they received the Holy Spirit. So Simon, who was a man of power, black magic and things of that nature, wanted that power for himself in the church age. And he is rebuked by the Apostle Peter in verses 18 through uh, 25. And Simon, at the end of that, experience expresses remorse. That's one of the reasons I think he was saved, is he expresses remorse and he asks for Peter to pray for him. So this is taking place there in verses 18 through 25. So this is all under Philip's ministry uh, in Samaria, Acts chapter eight, verses five through 25. So that's sort of the big picture. Now, obviously, we're not going to get through all of this 
today. I know you guys are sh shocked by that, but that's the direction that we're moving in. So first of all, notice the evangelization of Samaria, verses five through eight. We have Philip's preaching, verse five, the Samaritan's response to the preaching, verse six, authenticating signs and wonders, second part of verse six into verse seven, and the result of this whole conversion, massive conversion here in, conversions here in Samaria is joy. Verse eight. So notice, first of all, Philip's preaching, Acts chapter eight, verse five. It says, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. Now, who is Philip? Philip is one of the seven deacons that were selected to handle the distribution of food for the widows in Acts chapter 6. You might remember in Acts chapter 6 verse 5, these seven deacons were selected. The first deacon mentioned was a man named who? Anybody remember? Stephen. Stephen, the first deacon mentioned, is the focal point of Acts, end of Acts 6 up to his martyrdom in Acts 7. The second deacon selected, according to Acts chapter 6, verse 5, was Philip. So Philip becomes the focus of attention now that Stephen has passed from the scene. Philip becomes the focus of attention here in Acts chapter uh, 8. And initially, Philip is called a deacon, but over in Acts chapter 21 and verse 8, he's given this name, Philip the Evangelist. Acts 21 verse 8, Philip the Evangelist. So here, here's an example of an individual who is functioning as a deacon, but he also felt compelled to go to Samaria to share the gospel. So he was a very good deacon, but he was also a very prominent evangelist. So he was operating uh, under the office of deacon, functioning with the gift of evangelism, and that's who this man Philip is. Um, you look at Acts chapter 8, verse 5, and it says, Philip went down, very important language there, to the city of Samaria. Whoever wrote this book, we believe it's Luke, uh, liberals think someone wrote this long after the fact. But whoever wrote this book demonstrates a great deal of knowledge of the geography of the nation of Israel. Because Jerusalem is elevated geographically. So when it says here, Acts chapter 8 verse 5, Philip coming from Jerusalem, went down to the city of Samaria. That's exactly accurate. Galatians chapter 1 verse 17 says this concerning Jerusalem. Paul says, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. So up to Jerusalem, down from Jerusalem, that's geographically accurate. So this book couldn't have been written by someone, you know, that wasn't an eyewitness to the things that were, that are being described in this book. It's, it's written by someone who was there that understands the geography of the area. Uh, in fact, in your book of Psalms, you have 150 Psalms in your Psalter, uh, the book of Psalms divided into five books. There's a special group of psalms. It's Psalm 120 through 134. And those are called the Psalms of Ascent. Ascent meaning up. Those, that unit of material, Psalm 120 through Psalm 134, are the psalms that were sung by the Jews as they went up, Psalms of Ascent, they sang them as they were going up to Jerusalem to participate in the various Jewish feasts. 
three of which, if I remember right, were mandatory. Um, Leviticus 23 lays all of that out. So as they were traveling to celebrate these various feasts, they were going up. And so what developed out of that were these psalms of ascent that they, they sung. As they were going up to Jerusalem geographically to celebrate uh, the various feasts of Judaism. So when you go to Israel, I say when and not if, because you're going to get there one way or the other. You're going to be there for the millennial kingdom. So you might as well go over now and check out your real estate, see where you're going to live and all that kind of stuff. Um, if you're on a really good tour group, the bus driver will kind of put it into the gear that's needed to, to geographically go up to Jerusalem. And then the tour guide will have the people on the bus either read or sing or cite or chant together some of the Psalms of Ascent. And so you kind of get the feeling of what it was like, you know, in ancient times. Of course, they didn't, weren't on buses, <clears throat> but uh, the Jewish people, as they were traveling upward to Jerusalem to participate in these various feasts. So there's where Samaria is. Jerusalem, as I mentioned before, is a little bit further down south. And so here is Philip, the deacon, second deacon selected, functioning also here as an evangelist, leaving Jerusalem, going down to Samaria. And this word Samaria is a big deal. You see it there in verse 5. And if you go back to verse 1, the very end of verse 1, you'll see the word Samaria. That's a very big deal because that signals that we have shifted uh, in our outline of the book of Acts. <clears throat> Remember, the, the outline of the book of Acts was given by none other than Jesus after he rose from the dead, but before he ascended, he was speaking to his disciples and he made this statement in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and in so doing, he gave an outline. I think Luke records this because Luke uses this actually as an outline for the book of Acts. Jesus said to his disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem. That's part one of the book, chapters 1 through 7 that we're, we've completed. You shall be my witnesses in Judea, and what's that second one there? Samaria, that's part two of the book. <clears throat> that's chapters 8 through 12 that we're now entering. And you shall be my witnesses to the remote parts of the earth. That's part three of the book. That's the three missionary journeys of Paul. And then finally, at the end of the book of Acts, how Paul made it to Rome and once the gospel gets to Rome, Luke stops recording history because the assumption is all roads lead to Rome. So once it hits Rome, it's going to go everywhere. So Paul the Apostle um, is really highlighted with his missionary journeys and trip to Rome in that third section, chapters 13 through 28. So part one, we've finished, Acts 1 through 7. Now we're entering into part two of the book, Acts 8 through 12, the ministry in Judea and Samaria, spearheaded by Philip. <clears throat> Philip is going to go into Samaria first in this chapter. And as we'll see later in the chapter, he's going to go into Judea. And the church is going to have a ministry in those outer areas. But then Paul, who is not even Paul yet. He's not converted yet. He doesn't get converted till the next chapter, Acts chapter 9. is going to take the, the gospel to the remote parts of the earth through his three missionary journeys and trip to Rome where the gospel is going to get outside the borders of Israel. And that's in chapters 13 through 28. So when you see this word Samaria mentioned twice uh, once verse 5, once verse 1, that's a signal that we're now in the middle interior section of the book. So Philip goes and he 
leaves Jerusalem and he goes down to Samaria and he begins preaching the gospel. And notice the Samaritan's response, verse 6. It says, the crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip. Now, the Greek here is interesting. Basically, the way it translates is they were giving heed, these Samaritans, to what Philip was saying, and they kept on giving heed. So, so they listened to him, and they kept listening. So these were people that were very interested in spiritual things and spiritual truth. And Philip's ministry to the Samaritans was authenticated by signs and wonders. And you see that towards the end of verse 6 into verse 7. It says, as they heard and saw the signs which he was, uh, excuse me, as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing, Verse 7, for in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them, shouting with a loud voice, and many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. So Philip's ministry to the Samaritans is commemorated through signs and wonders. Now why is God allowing signs and wonders to take place to the Samaritans through Philip? One reason is Simon the sorcerer has been active in Samaria for many years. This is the guy that's about to get saved. And he was able to wow the whole city with his satanic signs and wonders. And God is showing that Satan is not the only one in the miracle business. The Holy Spirit is also in the miracle business And so Philip's ministry is commemorated also with various signs and wonders as God is showing that anything Simon can do through Satan's power, I can do as well. And there are many such accounts in the book of Acts of people performing signs and wonders. But what you'll notice in the book of Acts is the people performing the signs and wonders are either, number one, the apostles themselves... Or number two, people that the apostles laid hands on. People that had personal contact to the apostles. Delegates of the apostles. Arnold Fruchtenbaum has made that comment many times as we've been using some of his material going through the book of Acts. But earlier in the book of Acts, he said this, verse 12 provides evidence of apostolic authority. The account of the second persecution of the church begins by describing apostolic signs. He's talking about something that happened back in chapter 3 and chapter 4. But he makes this statement. He says, again, it is important to note that in the book of Acts, only the apostles and the apostolic uh, delegates who were appointed by the apostles by laying on of hands, were able to perform miraculous signs and wonders. This fact has come out four times thus far in the book of Acts. He gives the various scriptural citations where you can find it. And now it is repeated once again in this verse. Close quote. So yes, signs and wonders are happening in the book of Acts, but they're being conducted by the apostles or those functioning under the delegated authority of the apostles, like Philip, uh, the deacon, Stephen, the deacon, etc. So since the apostles are all dead, and they've been dead for 2,000 years, our basic doctrinal position is we don't see this level of miracles that we see in the book of Acts, where people have different spiritual gifts of healing, etc., and anybody they lay hands on gets healed. That was something that was a reality in apostolic times. We do not believe that that is something that is a reality today. If you look at the Sugarland Bible Church position statements, you'll see that we express ourselves on this, you know, very clearly. However, we're also very clear 
that even though there is no apostolic gift of healing today, that doesn't detract from the fact that God can and does heal today. It's just when God does it, he does it directly rather than indirectly through someone having some sort of gift of healing. So I very much do believe in divine healing. Um, I was sort of dependent on that <laughs> with the prayers of everybody praying for me uh, from Wednesday through Monday. Uh, I, I believe in miracles. I believe God heals. I believe in divine providence. Um, I just believe that when God does it, he does it directly rather than indirectly through someone claiming they have some sort of apostolic gift. So that is sort of the shift, you know, that's taken place in this realm of miracles uh, from the book of Acts to the present. And you'll notice there in verse 7 a distinction between physical problems and demonically caused problems. Look at verse 7, if you, if you could. It says, For in the case of many, this is Philip's preaching and healing ministry, which the Samaritans were open to. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them, shouting with a loud voice. And, there's a conjunction there, many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. So in the first part of the verse, you've got demonic issues. People being possessed by demons. Demons coming out of people. In the second part of the verse, it almost puts it in a different category. You have people that had physical problems. So can demons cause physical problems in people? Yes, they can. Uh, Luke's gospel talks about a woman who was bent over physically for a long time. And Jesus in Luke's gospel where this story is recorded makes the statement that Satan put her in that position. And there are many, many examples. Paul the Apostle, uh, 2 Corinthians 12, <clears throat> verses 1 through 10 who suffered from a thorn in the flesh, which was physical. He calls it there a messenger from Satan. So very clearly, the realm of the satanic, the realm of the demonic can cause physical problems in people. However, it's also equally true that not all physical problems that people suffer from are necessarily related to some kind of interface with Satan or demons. The truth of the matter is we would all have physical problems if Satan completely left us alone because we're living in a cursed world. We're not getting any younger. Amen. And it says in Genesis 3 verse 19, from dust you are to dust you shall return. You know, you put enough miles on the car and you got to start taking it in more frequently for repairs. Um, it's just a matter of, of aging, uh, getting older. You know, this last week I had recovery from some physical problems that I, for the first part of my life, I didn't even know I was susceptible to. Um, I'm not going to attribute that to Satan and the demonic. It's just the fact that I'm living in a non-resurrected body, which is going right back into the dirt from which it came, which is what God said would happen when our forebears had their foray um, into original sin. In fact, here on the screen, uh, there are a number of examples in Matthew's gospel. We, we don't have time, obviously, to look these up, but you could jot these down of people having physical infirmities and Satan and the demons aren't even mentioned. So sometimes people have physical infirmities because of the realm of Satan and the demonic, but we shouldn't infer from that that every physical problem somebody has is somehow demonically caused. And so I think that's what's interesting about Luke, who is a doctor, by the way, separating demonic oppression in the first part of the verse 
from physical oppression in the second part of the verse. It's almost like he's saying there can be a relationship between the two, but don't jump to the conclusion that every problem people have physically is related to Satan and the demonic. And then as this ministry spreads, you see the joy of the people, which is always the case wherever Jesus is proclaimed and experienced. What does it say in John 8, verse 32, is it? You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. It doesn't say you shall know the truth, and the truth is going to make you miserable your whole life. Um, And then Jesus goes on, I believe it's in John 8, and he, around verse 36, he says, whom the Son has set free is free indeed. So you get around Jesus and you get around his teachings, you get around the Holy Spirit, you get around the people of God, you get around a church that wants to follow the things of the Lord, and what you'll find is people walking in joy, not misery. A lot of people claim the name of Christ, but they're walking in total misery. And I would say that they're really not walking with the true Jesus, they're walking in some kind of religious form of legalism because Jesus is not in the business of destroying the lives of people. He's in the business of liberating the lives of people. And look at how the Samaritans react there in verse eight to what Philip is doing here as the Holy Spirit is using him. It says, so that there, so there was much, not a little bit, much rejoicing in that city. Jesus in John chapter 10 and verse 10 made uh, this statement. He says, the thief, referring to Satan, comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But, contrast, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. So it's, it's Satan that's oppressing people and trying to destroy people. John 8, 44 of Satan says he was a murderer from the beginning. I mean, it's him who wants to destroy your life, you know, ultimately your health, uh, your outlook on life, your emotional composition, your finances. I mean, any, anything that's good in your life, Satan is out to wreck. <clears throat> when I was in Campus Crusade for Christ, <clears throat> today they don't even call it that, they call it crew because they think crusade is too politically incorrect. You know, I liked it the old way myself. Um, Not because I'm into crusades, but it was just a statement that, you know, we're serious about Jesus, campus crusade for Christ. You know, they had this statement that we would use when we, we would evangelize people. We would say, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, which actually is true. I mean, that's John 10, 10. But there's a converse to that. I mean, if if God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, let's just just go to the inverse here. Satan hates you and has a terrible plan for your life. And the deception is people think, well, if I follow the things of the world and I follow the things of Satan, then the bondage of religiosity is going to leave me and I'll really be happy. The further I get from God, the happier I'm going to be. And how many of our youth think that? I got to get away from mom and dad. (laughs) I've got to get out there and sow some wild oats. I've got to be free to be me kind of mindset. And boy, I'm really going to experience enlightenment. And the truth of the matter is it's a deception that they're under. It's the exact opposite. The further you get away from God, the more miserable you are. The closer you are to God, the more you walk in joy. And that's what's happening with these Samaritans. Here's Philip preaching the good news. Uh, Miracles are happening. Healings are happening. Demons are being cast out of people. And it says in that particular city, the city of Samaria, there was not just rejoicing. There was much rejoicing. So we have the evangelization in Samaria. The church has now left Jerusalem 
and is now evangelizing outside the borders of Jerusalem, which is what Jesus said the church would do when he gave them their instructions that Dr. Luke uses in Acts 1 verse 8 as an outline of the book. Now, as all of these Samaritans are coming to faith, so does this magician, this dealer in black magic named Simon, and his conversion is recorded in verses 9 through 13. So here we have Simon's deception, verses 9 through 11. Samaria's response to Philip's preaching, verse 12. And then in verse 13, Simon himself responds by way of faith to Philip's preaching, just like the Samaritans, and he too is saved. And it's not fake faith. It's real faith. Because the same word that's used to describe the Samaritans' conversions that nobody questions in verse 12 the word believe, is the identical word that's used to describe the conversion of Simon the sorcerer, verse 13. So you can't play this game where you take the use of the word believe one way in verse 12 and a totally different way in verse 13. Nobody would ever read um, any sane piece of literature that way. Yet, that's how the majority of commentators, exegetes, theologians, and preachers treat these verses. The conversion of the Samaritans was real. The conversion of Simon the sorcerer was not real. Now, why, would, why are they doing that? <clears throat> because what is happening is they're reading the biblical text through the lens of their a priori theological system whether it be Calvinism or Arminianism. Calvinism, you have to have fruit to prove your faith is real. If there's no fruit, your faith was never real. Or Arminianism, uh, Simon maybe was saved, but he lost his salvation. Those systems are so ingrained in the thinking of people, it becomes almost like a set of lenses, a set of eyeglasses, a prism, if you will, through which they read the scripture. And if you were never taught any of those systems, let's say you're a brand new Christian, you don't know anything about Calvinism or Arminianism, there's no way that you would read those verses as inconsistently as do the professionals out there. So Simon is actually going to believe and be baptized. Why in the world would Philip baptize Simon if he thought his faith wasn't real? That doesn't make any sense in and of itself. He's going to believe and he's going to be baptized just like the rest of the Samaritans in the prior verse. Believed and were baptized. Everybody knows or thinks the Samaritans' faith was legitimate, but they don't think Simon's faith was legitimate. And Simon the sorcerer, now a Christian, is going to do some weird things some power-seeking things. Well, why is he doing that? He's had no opportunity to grow in the middle tense of his salvation. He doesn't understand the walk of obedience, discipleship. What does Paul tell us to do in Romans 12, verse 2? He tells us to renew our minds. Why do I have to renew my mind as a Christian? Because my mind thinks a certain way as an unsaved person. And just because I got saved doesn't mean my mind has been completely corrected. I have to constantly learn to think God's way. And it's a process. Simon has had no opportunity for that process. So that's why he's going to do some odd things here. It has nothing to do with his, uh, the authenticity of his initial salvation. It has to do with his lack of of opportunity to grow in the middle tense of his salvation. But as you go into verses 9 through 11, you have a description of Simon pre-conversion. What was this guy doing exactly in Samaria? Verses 9 through 11, we have the deceiver, Simon, verse 9, the deceived, the Samaritans, 
the type of deception that the Samaritans were under before the truth of the gospel penetrated Samaria. Verse 10. And then you have the deception that Simon was using on the population of Samaria. Verse 11. First of all, notice the deceiver. Verse 9. It says, Now there was a man named Simon, this is in Samaria, who formerly was practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria claiming to be someone great. Pre-converted Simon. pre Christian Simon performing miracles to the point that the whole city of Samaria was in a state of deception. Question, how does a man who doesn't know God at all perform miracles? Answer, and we've been trying to cover a lot of this in 2 Thessalonians concerning the coming of the Antichrist, which we're covering this section have been covering it in Sunday school, the Antichrist coming with signs and wonders. How can the Antichrist come with signs and wonders when he doesn't even know God? How how can Simon the sorcerer perform signs and wonders when he doesn't know Jesus? The answer is God is not the only miracle worker in the universe. Satan performs miracles too. Satan cannot perform miracles on an equal level as God, because Satan is a created being. God is the creator. No one does miracles greater than God. But having said that, Satan can put on a pretty good show. To us, as we look at satanic miracles, it's like they're coming from God, because they're real miracles. It's just from our vantage point, we don't understand that they're not as powerful as God's miracles. And in our 2 Thessalonians teaching, I've shown a number of times this chart or list. We won't walk through all of these verses we have in Sunday school. But it's a list that shows you every single miracle that I know of in the Bible that God has nothing to do with. Does God perform miracles? Of course he does. But what about all of these other miracles taking place that God is not responsible for? Where do those miracles come from? I mean, the very first entry there, Pharaoh's magicians, how are they able to imitate for the first couple of plagues exactly what Moses and Aaron were doing when Pharaoh's magicians had no connection to God at all? Well, they were obviously (laughs) dialed into occultic powers. So these occultic, satanic powers are real, and this is what Simon was dialed into. This is how he had these magical, magical arts type um, abilities. Uh, in fact, the name for sorcery here is where we get Simon's second name that he's commonly known by, Simon Magnus. Magnus comes from the uh, Greek word that's used here to describe Simon's satanic powers. So you do not legitimize something based on an experience. You do not say, I had an experience, therefore it's of God. A lot of people think that way. Truth is determined by an experience. That should be far from your thinking because you know enough of the Bible to understand that the devil can give all kinds of experiences as well. Truth, truth is never determined by an experience. Truth is always determined by does the experience and the teaching and lifestyle of the miracle worker line up with God's word? Because God can't lie, he can't say something one day and something different another day. It is, the scripture says, impossible for God to lie. 
So that becomes the barometer or the standard by, that we use to determine if something is of God or not. Now, most of the Christian world doesn't think that way. They're just looking for an experience. If, it, if I had an experience, if I had a dream, if I had a vision, it must be of God. But if you're um, astute in biblical truth, which you guys are or you wouldn't be here, you never determine truth by an experience. You just say about the experience, well, that's very interesting. But does the doctrine and the content of the character of the miracle worker align with what God has already said? Now, if that happens, then maybe I'm open to it being true. But a miracle in and of itself means absolutely nothing in terms of ascertaining what is true and what is not. And here it's very obvious that Simon is not of God even though he's performing miracles. Because as you look at the rest of this verse, it says in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria. Now, does this sound Christ-like to you here? Claiming to be someone great. Does someone that's walking by the power of the Holy Spirit walk around and claim to be someone great? No, because the Holy Spirit produces in people humility right? That is not the power of the Spirit as much as it's the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5 verse 22 and verse 23 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. I hardly got that one out. Could hardly get that one out tonight. Patience, hard to say it. Patience, kindness, Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. Does Simon sound gentle here, claiming to be someone great? Self-control. Against such things there is no law. So obviously you look at Simon and you see these miracles and you say, you know what, interesting miracles, they don't prove truth. Let's look at your teaching and your character. Obviously, Simon, you're not of God because your character is the exact opposite of what the Holy Spirit produces. He produces humility in people. In fact, Jesus Christ, did, what did he do? Did he come in the world claiming to be someone great? The opposite is true, right? The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Mark 10, I think that is. Philippians 2 verse 7 of Jesus, it says, but he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men. I don't know about you, but all of these paintings of Jesus where he looks like a male model, he looks like Fabio. Um, I don't mean to disappoint any of the ladies out there, but I think he was probably just an average looking guy. I think there's actually language in Isaiah 52 and verse chapter 52 and chapter 53 that he was just kind of run of the mill guy. I mean, he's the creator of the universe, but he didn't come into the world to make himself something, something great. In fact, this is the guy that surrendered his own life uh, on a cross. One of the most, if not the most, humiliating ways to die. So Simon is performing miracles, but he's clearly not Christ-like. Christ did not come into the world announcing himself as someone great, but Simon wants everybody to follow him because of this miracle-working power that he has. <clears throat> and this is what it means to test the spirits. 1 John 4 and verse 1 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets, like Simon the sorcerer, for example, have gone out into the world. And yet Simon is a tremendous deceiver uh, in Samaria and his deception that he is unearthing here is so powerful 
that he is deceiving an entire city, verse 10, from the smallest to the greatest. So we'll uh, pick it up next time here with verse 10. <clears throat> Seeing how the Lord actually took this man, Simon the sorcerer, and brought him to faith. Even though this man, Simon the sorcerer, as a Christian, is going to do some weird things. It's not attributable to the fact that he was never saved, as I'll show you. It's attributable to the fact that he has had zero time for growth and uh, mental renewal. And this will kind of move into the rest of Philip's ministry in Samaria. And then midway through the chapter, he's going to be told to leave Samaria and move into Judea because the Holy Spirit knows someone is coming down the road named the Ethiopian eunuch. So his conversion will take place, and that's how the gospel initially made it into Ethiopia. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for the book of Acts, the things that it teaches us. We're grateful for your providence and faithfulness in, in our lives. Um, help us to walk these things out. Uh, this week, we'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. God's people said. In the nursery. And if anybody wants to do any Q&A, I can stick around for that as well. Huh? Oh, thank you. All right, we good to go up there? Okay. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, Matt? Yeah, so just for the sake of people watching or listening, he's saying there's three big things that happen when a person gets saved. What was the first one thing? Yeah, their body becomes the temple of the Holy Spirit. What was You're eternally secure is number two, but the third thing is you're an infant in Christ. So you don't bring a newborn home from the hospital and say, help yourself to a ham sandwich when you get hungry. Because they're in a state of inability. They have to be nurtured in their new Christian faith. Simon the sorcerer is just that, is what Matt is saying. He hasn't had that opportunity for development. And that's why he's still interested in power because that's the type of thinking that dominated his pre-Christian life, and he's had no opportunity for mental renewal. So it's a statement here, <coughs> not about how Simon was not a Christian, uh, but he's an infant in Christ, right? Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Yes, sir. So just as in Henry Morris. Christ and Jesus in John 448. And then also he I guess in Christian literature, I guess this is the last time he spoken about the book of Acts. It's in Christian literature he was known to like bring in yeah, Gnosticism or something and uh become a opponent. So from the level of Peter, I think it's gonna get more Well, believe me, you're gonna get it. He wants more clarification because let me show you the slide that's coming to you. These are 
And just for the sake of people listening, he's reading from the Henry Morris Study Bible, which is an excellent study Bible. Henry Morris is one of my heroes. But Henry Morris in the Henry Morris Study Bible, like so many, I think, I'm not sure if the Ryrie Study Bible goes this direction or not, but they all are saying Simon wasn't saved. Now, they're going to give seven arguments as you were reading through those notes, and those are notes, right? They're not inspired. <laughs> uh, the, someone's commentary on what they think the Bible is saying. As you read through those notes, there's a number of arguments that were given as to why Simon was not saved. One of them you read, number seven, he's the founder of Gnosticism. I don't know if the notes said that specifically, but he's the founder of a false teaching. So there are seven arguments that you're going to hear over and over and over and over and over and over and over again as to why Simon wasn't saved. I'm going to give you those seven arguments. So look at all this you have to look forward to. And then I'm going to answer those seven arguments in, the, in this group of slides. And even before we get into those arguments, I'm going to show you why he was saved. He believed, just like the Samaritans. He was baptized. Why would Philip baptize him if we don't know if he was saved or not? And at the end of the paragraph, he experiences remorse for what he's done. That's evidence of the Holy Spirit in him. And because his conversion is described exactly like the rest of the Samaritans, to say that Simon maybe wasn't saved, you got to you got to call into question now everybody in Samaria. Maybe they weren't saved too. See, that's that's the awkwardness of this, how people are reading this through their theological lens lenses, by relying upon these seven arguments. And I'm really happy that you're reading the Henry Morris Study Bible, great study Bible, and I'm really happy you brought that example up because even the best of our best people fall into this error. So it's obviously too big a subject to get into tonight, but that's, that's what's coming. That helps it all. So the, the issue is not what Henry Morris says, it's not what Charles Ryrie says, it's not what Andy Wood says, is what saith the scripture. Read the scripture the way it wants to be understood rather than trying to fit the scripture into a presuppositional box. And I'm telling you folks, I've been at this probably, I don't know, longer than everybody in here, but I've been at it for a long time. Uh, I've been on my knees praying that God would not allow me to do this as a teacher. Because I've seen good person after good person after good person who are wonderful on many other subjects go the wrong direction. Because before they read that section of the Bible, they put on their Calvinist glasses or their Arminian glasses, and they misread what God is clearly saying in his word. So we always have to be in a position where we're not rewriting the text based on our theology. We want the text to control our theology, not our theology to control our Bible reading. Does that help at all? So, more, more coming on that. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, Matt? Uh -huh. Basic. Yeah, and basically for those listening, he's basically saying we need to understand Christian growth and the Christian life. 
um, you, he, you use words like mechanics, but whatever words you want to use, basically we're talking about growth in the middle tense of our salvation. In fact, there's more biblical truth devoted to that subject than people getting saved initially. So obviously our growth in Christ is a big deal to God. And if we're not growing in Christ the way we should, we end up kind of like Simon the Sorcerer ended up. All right, well, I appreciate y'all. Um, let's see, Kate, would you mind closing?